Hey, brother. How are you doing? What's up, Harsh? How's your day going so far? All killer. I just got back from the gym, actually. Nice. You're trying what about to... you? It's going pretty well, dude. Um, So I don't know if you guys were affected yesterday, but in the US, there was like this nationwide outage for a bunch of AT&T and Verizon users. Were you guys affected by that? No, not here. Why was the outage there? So one of the reasons that people are saying is because of the infrastructure reasons. Apparently, AT&T had some issues. The other reason people are saying was because it was a Chinese cyber attack. So right now, it just happened. So people are still diagnosing the issue. It was unique, though, because it kind of gave me a peek into what life is like without a phone. And a lot of people were just going mad yesterday. So, a few years ago, there was a citywide electricity shutdown in Mumbai. Mm -hmm. And the government data came out and said that it was because of a hacker attack. And I, I just couldn't believe it, you know, electricity going out because of a hacker attack. What the fuck? So, despite all these people sounding crazy, you know, like Chinese cyber attack, I'm inclined to trust the possibility that it is possible that maybe a cyber attack caused the outage. Mm, you think so? Yeah, I do think that these companies are not super likely to admit what happened because, you know, it affects their market stock and everything. For example, when Vodafone got hacked, they just deleted evidence of the hack. They're like, fuck it. We, you know, they just deleted the hack instead of educating trying to figure out who did the hacking because they just didn't want to, they did not want it to become public knowledge. So I think a lot of companies are incentivized to just hide the fact that they got hacked. They they just swallow it. Yeah, because most businesses, I mean, there's going to be moments where they go through one of those errors. But for one of these broadcast services, if they're down even for an hour, it's a massive attack on their reputation. Because what happened yesterday, Harsh, was at a certain point, I went to like the 7-Eleven right by me. And this is when the services were down. And there was this one guy that was panicking. It was like this one white fat guy. He's like, I don't know where I am. How do I get back home? So he's in Tampa, but he's actually from, I think this place called Largo. So it's not that far away. But since his Google Maps isn't working, he literally doesn't know how to get back home. And different people are giving him like basic instructions. And you know what guys are like with instructions? Like when one guy asks another guy for directions, even if the guy doesn't know the directions, they'll be like, yeah, yeah, you just go down and you take a left and you take another right. You're back home. They'll lie. (laughs) So this guy is in 7-Eleven stuck and he doesn't know how to go back home. And it just made me realize like in this era, not having your phone on you, it's, it's like a handicap in some ways. I I was in a situation where I had to be two, three days without internet. Mm-hmm. And it was insane. Like, you can't do anything. You can't run your business. You can't talk to anybody without the net. It's a, I, I cannot live without it in the sense, I mean, of course, you can live without it. But practically speaking, it's like a necessity of life. You can't earn money without the net. You can't talk to anyone you know without the net. It just, you need it. You do, man. And there was like another thing where my parents yesterday, they were going to go to Philly. So they needed to call an Uber from their place to the airport, but they couldn't do that. And I don't know how they ended up getting the ride. I think they hit up one of their friends, but the only way to hit up your friend was to go on the laptop and hopefully they were on WhatsApp at the same time that you were because they couldn't just text them. So it doesn't seem like a big deal, if it's something that's not happening to you, but if it's happening to you and you have like some sort of event, you're traveling, you're stranded in the middle of nowhere, not having your phone on you is like a national emergency. So yesterday, AT&T's like reputation took a huge hit, even though they were just down for like six to seven hours. For the most part, they're always working. But those six to seven hours, like people just started to look at them differently. You know, it's one of those things, right? Where you think something is infallible. You you just rely on something as being a thing. 
mm-hmm. and then suddenly something happens and they're like okay what the fuck that is that possible that can happen now do I, now I have to account for things like this mm-hmm. a little bit like covid you know 15 days of permanent downtime and suddenly now when i think of things i'm like okay if i get this how will it survive a fucking lockdown yeah if you get what i'm saying mhm it's a lot of these fundamental assumptions you have about life and it's a bit surprising when they get violated like i can't go out because i'm not vaccinated what the fuck mhm did you get like hit with a stick like w- when you weren't wearing a mask get what like i heard like some uh, like places they were hitting you with like a stick if they saw you walking outside without a mask yeah that stuff was happening in smaller villages where compliance rates are really low and people are not very well educated so they would hit the person with a stick if they were if they were out in the day so it wasn't for not wearing a mask mm-hmm. it was because in the first 15 days right there was a lot of panic and fear among people and the government had said don't come out for 15 days but some people but they don't give a fuck so they would just actually come out so the police were given the right to actually hit the people who were coming out of their house it wasn't for not wearing a mask it was for going out of your house in the first 15 days mm, of lockdown not following the lockdowns okay although i think it was a bit too much mm-hmm. to actually hit people but i can also see the fact that certain places in my country at least are so rowdy that you cannot govern them without the threat of violence did it work when um they it were hit worked, with the stick worked. yeah i doubt a lot of people were hit by the stick it was mostly done by the government on tv just to scare people that this can happen so mm-hmm. people comply a bit more if that makes sense you know it's you don't need to do it to everybody you just need to show that it can be done to some people and that makes everybody a bit more cautious yeah What about the region that you were in? Or was there a different kind of punishment? There wasn't a lot of punishment where I am from, but yeah, they would fine you. Like I paid like 2-3 thousand bucks in fines during COVID. Dang, man. That's like that was another one of those moments where suddenly some sort of crisis can happen and the thing that was affected a lot were these grocery shops where toilet paper was running out, you couldn't get food. A lot of the times I would go into Walmart and there were like aisles that were just completely empty. So, yeah, it's one of those things man where when everything's working well, you take it for granted, but you could just have like one day where something goes really off and you're starting to question everything. I'm telling you man, one day can change your life forever. I'll I'll mm-hmm. give you like a strong somewhat related example. So, And there's a guy I know and this guy is driving so he drives a motorbike and something happens to his bike and he just falls off and now he limps every single time he wants to walk so he, his his leg didn't recover properly uh. and he just needs to limp from place to place and this was like a healthy fit young guy you know one of those adventure type people right who go on a motorcycle to lay the dark and everything mm. like days and days of biking and one fatal accident and now you know he can't walk cr- correctly and his life has completely changed so it only takes yeah. one day to completely change everything i have a friend of mine who has a cousin sister who just died all of a sudden apparently she drank some water and then choked on the water i didn't even know what that was possible but what like, the heck uh, yeah it's like a 22 year old girl and she just died for no goddamn reason i mean completely healthy perfect health and she just drank some water and apparently it went in her lungs or something happened and she mm-hmm. just choked on it and died what the heck damn man that's kind of exactly. scary exactly yeah, i know right I'm like what the <laughs> fuck that can happen so we take a lot of things for granted you know for example when you walk out in the sun you don't get hit by lightning i mean we take that for granted but technically it's it's possible mm-hmm. you know you just you're just going somewhere you get hit by lightning it, it's a it can happen so it's one of those things where every once in a while you realize that there are minor risks in life that you just ignore because you can't do shit about it but yeah. they do exist 
and not having internet is people have just thought you know people typically just think that everything is going to work as expected but to make internet work there are a lot of moving pieces there are lots of satellites cables and everything and it's a complex fragile system and it can be taken away from you yeah back to your point about like how one day could change your life i feel like these sort of concerns come up more when you're a parent because if you're like let's say a solo person a lot of the times you're somewhat aware of it and different people can take different paths one becomes mainly a pessimist other ones like okay i know bad things can still happen but i'm not going to move in fear so they become an optimist but when you become a parent i feel like you just automatically lean towards the pessimism side this is me just observing from afar because you never know what can happen to your kid and i feel like it brings those fears to the forefront of your mind because a lot of the kids when they see their parents being like very overprotective they're just like mom dad we've been good for this long what's the chances that something bad can just happen out of the blue moon but from the parents perspective they're like just because you've lived 27 years perfectly does not mean that the next day you can't just die and that's a fear that i see a lot of them just carry it's a pretty stressful situation to be in i wonder how a lot of parents maintain enthusiasm yeah i can see that you know i can i can tell you a bit from my perspective here where you know earlier if i would try to do something a little bit risky my family would be like hey why are you doing that it's risky and i would be like shut up like let me just do what i want stop mm, bothering it's me. my life mom <laughs> yeah not like, yeah kind of but you know sometimes it's a little more overblown in their head for example if you're rappelling right I mean, mm -hmm. it looks a bit scary when you see a picture of it. Like, you know, there's a rope and, you know, if the rope breaks, you might die. I mean, you will mm -hmm. fall 60, 70 feet and then you will die. So it looks scary. So my family, like, don't go rappelling, you might die. It's, it's extremely risky. But really, mm -hmm. it's not risky at all if you know what you're doing. And, you know, if, unless you're doing something very, very stupid. But now that I'm thinking about it, would I let my wife go rappelling alone? <laughs> no. Right. <laughs> <laughs> my fear for because we all have that like illogical fear for me it's riding motorcycles i don't give a damn how uh people want to train they're like trust me bro if you understand the fundamentals it's safer than riding a car i don't care whenever i hear motorcycles automatically i just get scared so i don't want hey, my kid it's doing safer it. than riding a car so bro hardcore motorcycle enthusiasts they'll be like statistically speaking more people have died in the hands of a car than a motorcycle they come with all this logic they've informed their mind on this they think they're going to get me to change my mind and after their long plea i'm just like yeah whatever i'm still never gonna ride a motorcycle i wouldn't even feel comfortable like my partner riding a motorcycle fuck motorcycles do not ride a motorcycle i'm telling you it's the death machine i know a bunch of people who've gotten severely injured or died on motorcycles mm -hmm. don't do it it's it's too risky and i'll tell you what i'll tell you what i'll give you an example there was a guy who crashed his bike into my car and fell off he was lucky that the person driving behind him after he fell off was able to brake and not hit him so in a motorcycle accident you die from your own mistakes and you die from other people's mistakes so if i crash into a motorcycle from my car the mm -hmm. motorcyclist dies if the motorcyclist crashes into me the motorcyclist dies <laughs> i mean it's a lose lose situation it's you know? the dumbest thing you can do dude it's such a dumb thing to do even i see people riding their motorcycles at night and they're very really hard to see they're easy to hear at night but imagine if someone just can't hear well and their vision is eh, whatever what if you get hit by a truck i mean these are the stuff that motorcyclists don't think about because their identity is tied to that motorcycle but if you're not that into motorcycles it's very easy to see like it's one of the dumbest things you can do and thank god bro in high school um i i was taught this lesson because it was my junior year in high school i was waiting for the bus dude i want to go grab candy right as my bus was coming and apparently there was this one guy that was trying to do all these little tricks on his motorcycle okay just trigger warning for anyone that's listening i'm about to say something really disgusting he's like doing these little tricks and stuff suddenly like he bumps into a rock he flings over his motorcycle flies across the street his head hits the pavement 
and it explodes. Ouch. Bro, a bunch of the fucking kids in my junior year saw that. And thank God I was like getting candy. So I didn't see it. And afterwards, I come back. I see a bunch of girls crying. And a lot of the guys were like, oh, my God, I can't get that image out of my head. And there were like people covering that guy that who just died. Thank God I didn't see that, bro, because I'm pretty sure it would have like, I don't know, like I would have just remembered that. But I just saw everyone's reactions afterwards. And it just I was just like, shit, man, I'm never getting on a motorcycle. Do not drive a motorcycle. I'm telling you, I've seen way too many motorcyclist deaths. And, you know, I mean, 90 about 60 to 70 percent of the time, it's the motorcyclist's fault. Because these mm. guys like to drive at insanely crazy speeds. And for some reason, they enjoy driving very close to cars. So, for example, if there's two cars and there's very little space between them, this motorcyclist will try to drive fast but through the space in between the two cars. So, I don't know why they do that. Maybe they get some thrill out of it. But these guys die at a very high rate. Just don't mm-hmm. drive a motorcycle. Drive a cheap car if you have to, but don't drive a motorcycle. Don't drive a motorcycle. I've always thought people were weird when they were like too obsessed with cars. Like, um, they're like doing donuts in their cars. They're like putting these loud ass engines in their cars, tinting their windows. Something often is emotionally wrong with them. And I wrote something in my newsletter one time that was pretty polarizing. ArmaniTalks.com slash newsletter, where I said, if I'm a parent, I would rather my kids hang out with smokers rather than hang out with kids that were obsessed with cars. Because when you're too obsessed with cars, you do stupid shit like drag racing, donuts, and all of that. And one mistake is all it takes for you to just ruin your life. So people who are obsessed with cars, they just die very early out of the blue moon. Like they'll die at age 25, 32, um, just out of the blue moon. So I would rather have my kids hang out with smokers rather than hardcore car fanatics. How do you define obsessed with cars? I mean, are you talking about people who are like, you know, they know everything about cars, what, how the engine is and everything? Or I mean, well, you know, racers, what? you mean things like racers. So a lot of these guys, like they start off, it's kind of like with like drugs, like you start off light and then you just keep getting more intense into that rat race. A lot of these guys start off just knowing about cars, which I think is honorable. It's good to know about different models of cars. Then they start to tweak with their cars. They take out one engine, put another one. Now they're getting their hands involved. Now they've graduated. Then they start to like do these little racing. Like they see someone that's trying to like, you know, overtake them in the traffic. So they try to overtake them. So once they overtake them, they graduated to another level. Eventually they're trying to like race uh, their friends, right? They don't get caught a couple of times. They graduated to another level. Then a lot of these guys, they do a thing called car shows or like car meetups, um, mud racing, a lot of this BS. So now they're like really deep into the rabbit hole. They're seeing how far they can push their car. And they're doing all these different tricks. They're not really trained. They're just a bunch of reckless guys that are obsessed. It's their drug. That's when they become obsessed. So it starts off light, but then it gets really intense as time passes on by. I see your like point, that? but I don't agree with it in the sense that I think, you know, of with the 100 people who are obsessed about cars in the sense that they know a lot about cars, maybe one of them actually graduates to being a, you know, a drag racer or some shit like that. I think most people are just, you know, they just like cars. Mm, okay. Do you know, like, hmm, I'm trying to say, I'm trying to think because... In India, if I'm not mistaken, m- most of the roads are packed, right? Like, are there like ever moments where you have like a lot of free real estate to like do whatever you want with your car? Oh yeah, a lot of highways are co- very empty, and you can really, really go at really high speeds on them. The thing is that in India, you cannot modify a car; it's illegal. Okay, so I think that is also playing a factor. Where here, you could actually build your own cars as well. And there's, do you guys have like car shows or drag race shows and stuff like that? We don't have any drag race shows. It's it's a very illegal thing in India. Indian Indian people are very risk averse in general. And this type of stuff gets shut down very fast. We do have car shows, but that's mostly just rich people showing off all their cars. 
but mm. we don't have drag shows we don't have people doing stunts with cars to be honest and to top it off it's extremely extremely illegal in india to even make like normal modifications to cars so for example if you wanted to increase how bright your headlamps were and you kind of added something to it that's also illegal okay so what i'm saying probably doesn't really apply to you guys let me ask you though do, do people have like those really loud engines that they modified on their car like that no car? you can't do that in india okay okay so what i'm saying definitely doesn't apply to you guys but here dude a lot of people just modify their cars it becomes their obsession they feel a lot of like if their boss yells at them or something they take out that aggression on the roads i mean these guys are very silly dude and i've seen a lot of guys that have just died early and trust me getting obsessed with your car is a thing i can see i can see your perspective i'm not you know since i don't live in your culture that much i'm not well you know not that in tuned with it to know exactly what you're talking about but if that mm. is a situation then yes i can see i can see people dying from getting into rash driving accidents <clears throat> yeah it's pretty crazy how many people just get in the habit of driving rashly because you have to understand that the machine you are in can very easily kill you let's say that you're driving at 100 kilometers per hour if you let's say bump into a truck or something let's say you bump on the side at that speed the car is going to lose all of its balance pretty fast and you will have a lot of injuries that are going to persist for the rest of your life if you survive it mm. i had a friend who was in a car accident where his car turned like it you know you know does these rolls at very high speed it doesn't just stop and ever since then he's had a bunch of blood clots in his head and Ooh. he's like this friend of mine he's like i'm alive now but i can't tell if i'm going to be alive say 5 years from now or 10 years from now because my head is full of blood clots and any time you know there's a risk that one of these blood clots might stop flow in my brain mm-hmm. and you know then i would get a brain hemorrhage and i might die but there's nothing i can do about it because you can't really remove blood clots but he's like yeah. i'm happy to be alive yeah sometimes like you'll be alive but you'll be alive in such a sad state where some of these guys have a lot of suicidal thoughts they're just like man i wish my life was taken away why even live like this um the thing with cars though dude is that your mistakes can end someone else's life too like a lot of people are doing the right things but since you you want to get cute with it you want to drag race and do all of that stuff you uh lose control and you end up killing someone else someone that was there was actually a case like this in Tampa where this uh like these two teenagers they were like racing each other they were going 105 on a 60 miles per hour place and one of the guys ended up crashing into a mom who was driving her newborn daughter so he just took two lives just like that and he survived so i'm just like what the heck what's wrong with these guys man i'm telling you these people need to learn how to drive i lost my grandfather to the stuff so i can oh, you completely did? sympathize yeah i never got to meet my grandfather because someone drove a car on him before i was born no way dude that's so sad um did your grandpa like live a like a long life up until then i don't know exactly how old he was maybe he was in his 50s 60s since i never met him i never took that much of an interest in him okay but i think he lived he he wasn't that old but mm-hmm. kind of through the lives of my father and you know his younger sisters and everybody into a lot of turmoil because you know like i told you we come from a agrarian background in the sense of like farmers in a small place and you lose the head of your family and then suddenly things start to not work out so well for you so it mm. kind of destroyed our family for quite a while but going back to the central point as someone who is on the wheel you have to be responsible not just for yourself but also for other people like you cannot just drive however you want it's not doesn't work that way i do think that the laws need to be made much more rational for example i i think i think a law like this would be very very good for example let's say that you kill someone while driving and uh, 
it was your fault then you have to be put to death and you cannot be allowed to walk away like let's say you are the one driving and you, it was it's your fault let's say you break a signal and you're being impatient and you kill someone you have to be put to death let's say that you severely injure somebody and it's your fault then you have to be severely injured as well i mean like you know break your bones or some shit like that some kind of extreme severe physical punishment needs to be met out to people when it's their fault if for example you severely injure someone and you just walk away in the sense you don't call the ambulance or something and you'd like okay i'm going to just run from the situation and the person dies then you have to be put to death if you call an ambulance and the person dies then you know the punishment needs to be less severe maybe like 10 years in jail but not putting to death because at least you called the ambulance so you did your best in that situation so i think the laws need to be made much more stringent for things like this and i think dash cam should be mandatory mhm yeah i mean there has to be something because that's one of the reasons for early deaths do a lot of people like get into car accidents like there a lot of people get into car accidents in india it's very common i think half of the world's car accidents happen in my country no way but what about rickshaw drivers do they like uh, do a lot of them die early deaths they don't die early deaths because rickshaw drivers typically tend to be in cities and cities don't have speeds that are high enough for you to die mm-hmm. but they tend to be the ones who are frequently in accidents because they drive extremely rashly and they do not follow the rules of traffic they don't follow any traffic laws they just mm-hmm. do whatever they want there's a small space between two cars they'll try to squeeze inside so they're the worst of them all <laughs> but they don't die see what happens is you have to understand there's two places right there are cities and there are highways highways have fewer accidents but the accidents are bigger because you know you're on higher speeds so you tend to die if you are in a accident in the highway probably someone has died on the other hand cities have much more cars it's much more congested people drive slower there are more accidents because there are more cars more turns but the accidents are not fatal it's more like you know someone rear ended you and you know dented your car and things like that not you know a truck drove over you mhm and in the cities there's a lot of just regular citizens that are walking on the roads right as the cars yep. are driving yes you do that sometimes don't you Yeah, we do that. I think I I do that every single day. You don't get scared? No, man. I I've, I've been doing it ever since I was a kid, so I don't get scared. It, you can't cross the road without doing that in India. <laughs> mm. <laughs> What about at night time? Is it just as packed? It's less packed at night time, but mm. people tend to drive a bit faster at night time, so you have to be more careful. Do you guys have subways? In some places we do. in some places we do not in some places we have those things where you have to climb a bunch of stairs and cross the road and climb down like a road crossing bridge oh okay and you guys have trains as well yeah but i don't like trains i avoid them you don't like it indian trains are extremely crowded and the crowd in them is not very civilized so mm-hmm. it's not a very pleasant experience to be in an indian train I prefer flying every time I can do it I I would I strongly prefer flying and that's saying a lot about trains because I don't actually like to fly you used to though right I used to like flying back when I would do it infrequently you know if it, if you're flying once or twice a month then you're like okay flying is awesome man you know you get to go to the airport and things like that it used to be like a thing especially if you do it very infrequently like once every 3 months then yeah you enjoy it a lot but try flying twice a week it's annoying dude i i actually don't know how people do it if you have to travel a lot for work or you're one of those like travel for life kind of guys i don't know how you get excited to go on a flight infrequent it's fine right but when you keep on doing it or this year like i've traveled multiple times already uh, and i just dread going on flights sometimes you don't even know who you're going to sit next to Do you ever talk to the people sitting next to you? Not really. I typically don't talk to anybody. I'm typically just trying to get some work done or try to sleep a little bit more. 
Mm-hmm. Flights will typically ruin my day because normally I would sleep. I normally I sleep at like four o'clock in the night, and I'm used to waking up around noon because I work late at the night. And what happens is, if you're going somewhere, you will typically book your flight for like eight a.m. in the morning. Mm-hmm. So that means that I'm gonna get maybe one hour of sleep right before I fly, and for some reason I can't sleep when I'm sitting. I just can't sleep when I'm sitting. I can't do it. So it kind of ruins my day to have to fly. And in the last six months, I must have flown like thirty, forty times, largely because I got married. And it was horrific. I did not enjoy it. You, you know, at first it's fun, but next. Then you're like, fuck! I have to sit for one hour at the airport. Then I have to sit for some hours in the flight. Then I have to, you know, sit for some hours in a car. It's just like, ah, oh, fuck this bullshit. This is so annoying. And you guys have the TSA check-ins and all that, right? Yeah, man, not not fun at all. Dude, that's the thing that I hate the most. Like everything else, I could tolerate. But the thing that I hate the most is when we're doing that little TSA check-in, where you take off our belt, our shoes, all that, and then like you know stand like this. I hate that, dude. Um, last time I was going to Philly, and I was just doing a typical TSA like always, and then the guy's like, "Hey, sir, our uh, machines detected unusual behavior. Uh, come with me, real quick." I was like, what the hell? Like, I, I'm literally wearing what I normally wear in flights. I just wear like pajamas and stuff. So this guy's like saying, I'm gonna have to touch you here, here, here. Okay, so just so you're not weirded out. I'm gonna have to put my fist up your ass. I was like, okay, oh, what are you gonna? <laughs> so I'm just kind of like dazed, you know, because I just like woke up. I'm just like really sleepy, and this dude's like patting me down and like putting his hand near my crotch and shit to see if I don't <laughs> have any weapons. I'm like, what the <laughs> hell are you doing, bro? Like, hurry up. <laughs> <laughs> you're you're enjoying this too much, my dude. So <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if the people who work at airport security are gay or something, you know. Or some of these guys, they'll pull pull over like an attractive girl, like, "Ma'am, our machines detected some unusual behavior. Come with me." <laughs> I wonder if they have any standards to prevent stuff like that. Probably, dude, because some of these dudes, if you look at them, they're very uh, creepy looking, and a lot of them have anger issues, where. They they feel very powerful in this moment, so they'll like yell at a lot of the passengers. They'll be like, "Hey, I thought I told you to take out your laptop from your bag." Like they're yelling. I'm like, "Yo, chill the hell out, man!" Like it's not that big of a deal. For wonder, what it's worth, I wouldn't encounter that type of bullshit in America. You in 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 India at least, mm-hmm. airport staff is very nice, very polite. And they don't bother you too much. I I don't know why, but American airport staff is next level. They like try to put your hand like put their hand literally in your ass cheeks. I'm like, what, what <laughs> are you trying to do? <laughs> Not all the time. It is an outlier situation. But I will tell you this: airport people have gotten ruder, um, and I think it's because a lot of um, think about it, dude. That's their job where they have to just like say the same stuff to different people over and over again. And after a certain point, I think they just snap. So that's why that bitchiness comes out. That mixed in with, um, they just feel powerful in this moment because they could, you know, really sway the direction the passengers are gonna have. So it's a mix of that. But yeah, I hate flights. I don't know in India at least. Like I've never encountered a rude security person in the airport. For example, like recently when I was flying, I had like a bunch of water bottles and a bunch of you know soda bottles in my bag, mm-hmm. and uh, the you know the security people they're like, okay, in this bag there's like six bottles, and I'm like, okay, and he's like, why are there six bottles in the bag? And I'm like, you know, the, the hotel had for free, so I just took them. <laughs> 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 and the guy starts laughing. <laughs> oh, okay, they're less strict there then. Here they would make you throw that away. <laughs> I mean, it was you know, it's like you know the hotel is giving them away for free. Fine, mm-hmm. I'll take it. <laughs> well, I'm not gonna <laughs> drink all this soda, but I'll take it if it's free. <laughs> Dude, the last trip I went on, I bought this really nice cologne, and I was completely unaware of the size that you're not allowed to take through the TSA. This amazing cologne, I go through the TSA, and they're like, "Sir, this is a little too big. Uh, you're gonna have to throw this away." I'm like damn man like come on man you can't hook me up like no sir you have to throw it away 
So they make you throw it away too. They don't throw it away. They're like, they give it to you and they <laughs> tell you to toss it in the trash can. Apparently that's one of their protocol. So it, it seems a little more, bit more cruel, you know? So that's Man, one of the things I've I'm noticed. You, the biggest loss I've made at the airport was like a hundred dollar knife. It was Carrying more a knife in was, the airport. I was coming back from a trek, and uh, you know it was in my trekking kit, and I forgot to put the trekking kit in the check-in. I it was in my hand baggage, and you know when they're scanning the thing, okay, there's a big knife in here, and you know it's one of those professional knives, you know those Smith and Wesson, very good quality knife, and they're mm-hmm. like, okay, so this one has to go, and I'm like, oh fuck, oh, it's a hundred bucks. Dang, dude. I mean, I could completely understand their perspective on this one. See, you deserve to be patted down. I carry a cologne, I get patted <laughs> down. You carry a knife, you don't get patted down. <laughs> yeah, but what it's worth, I made it to like most of the airport with a knife in my bag. <laughs> what the heck, dude? Have you guys ever had like... Um... Okay, go ahead, go ahead. One time I was carrying a hookah in my bag because my mom liked it. My mother liked a hookah when, you know, we were on our way. And she's like, this would make like a nice, uh, you know, showpiece. So I'm carrying a big metal hookah in my bag. And of course, I'm not like trying to hide it or anything. But I don't know what they have at airports. I don't know some kind of security scanners. But like a bunch of security people just like come up to me and they're like, what's in your bag? And I'm like, you know, stuff is in my bag. <laughs> I mean, I don't know what's in my bag. What are you asking? <laughs> like, are you carrying any weapons? Uh is there any jewelry in your bag? We, we know there's metal in your bag. I'm like, you can just check my bag. I have sweets in my bag because I came back from a wedding, you know. Mm-hmm. And the guy is, just, you know, okay, he's like, okay, okay, go through, go through. And I'm telling you, I got like the most thorough patting down on that day at the airport. <laughs> <laughs> With the guy is checking every single pocket of my cargo shorts. And oh, no. He, you know, it's a, I mean, I can see their perspective, you know. And he's like questioning my mom about like what is this? She's like, it's a showpiece, it's a hookah. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a very funny day. And yeah. I'm like, there's sweets in there. If you guys want to eat them, you can eat them. <laughs> For all of your hard work. <laughs> I care more about the sweets and the hookah. And cargo shorts have like thousands of pockets, so you really put them to work. Yeah, to top it off, I had like a lip balm in my cargo shorts. And when the guy is doing the padding, he's like, what's this? What's this? I'm like, this is remove it and see it. So I have to remove it. And then he's checking it. You know, he's removing the lip balm, examining it and making sure there's nothing inside the lip balm. So I can see why these guys have to be very thorough. Because, you know, even one bad incident can ruin the reputation of that entire airline or country, you know? Yeah, absolutely, man. Especially after 9-11, things got way stricter. So, um, no, it makes a lot of sense. Um, that's really insane, though. Uh, it's um, I, I don't know how people do it. And the thing is, sometimes when you'll go on a plane, Harsh, like the people next to you really want to have a conversation. And you could be like the guy that doesn't want to have a conversation, but they keep weaseling you into a convo. Um, if you ever sit next to old people, like they really are going to make you feel guilty for not talking to them. And... That, that's never happened to you, right? You normally just sit with your wife. So I only recently got married, but mm-hmm. I have had quite a few conversations with people on planes. I mean, it's fun. You don't mind doing it. You know, I'm pretty happy to talk to people. Mm-hmm. The only time it bothers me is, you know, if you're doing something in the plane, let's say I'm writing an article and there's a guy, he's like looking into my laptop and starts reading the article out loud. <laughs> like, what the <laughs> fuck are you doing? <laughs> What if he recognizes you? Wait a minute, your life map money? <laughs> um, I got away with it so far. So You're like an Indian Batman. People still are probably trying to get your identity. Um, you, you've been very good with it. I'm surprised like no one's ever like, no one from your immediate squad are like, huh, I wonder if this guy is this guy. It's mostly because I'm popular for my tech stuff, right? It's yeah. not, I'm not super popular for my video or podcast and things like that. I mm-hmm. mean, we do these podcasts, but we don't get so many people listening to it. So right. people don't register by my voice. I've had situations where someone I know 
is posting a quote by me on on the whatsapp say this i'm like huh interesting so this guy mm-hmm. reads what i'm writing <laughs> <laughs> but you should if, just you troll know, him and be like oh, you the troll him. yeah you should troll him and be like yo who is that tool no 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 i'm not gonna <laughs> touch that you know let, let me you know you know it's like there's like us don't go and poke the honest nest yeah does your wife know about this of course does she like consume your content is she a fan Oh yeah 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 she's been reading all of my articles. Do you feel comfortable with her reading your articles? Yep. Okay, so I'm a little different dude where I like certain boundaries. I like it more when strangers consume my content rather than people that I know. There's an advantage to having your wife read your articles because it makes sure that she thinks in an aligned way. Mhm. Or if she disagrees with something, she can tell you and then you can tell her why she's wrong or why you're wrong. Or, you know you know you can have a discussion about it and you can teach her things i think right. that it makes sense to have them read it also it kind of makes sure that you guys are on the same page for example if i learn something interesting i also want her to know it I mean she can teach that to our kids what's your thoughts if she starts creating content if she starts doing what creating content oh yeah i've been helping her do that i've been helping her start some online business stuff So so far lately she's been trying out things like a video account on Twitter and things like that. So not creating her own content but kind of trying to get in the world of online business. I mean she's pretty young so she doesn't have enough experience to truly create a lot of meaningful content yet. Mm-hmm. But maybe in a few years I do think there's a lot of opportunities that she can take with regards to you know eventually we'll have kids so maybe she can make content about raising them. or you know she's very very good at cooking so maybe she can do something like that so there's a lot of opportunities out there that she can explore and i'm helping her do that that's good that's good cuz some people like they don't want their partner uh, creating content cuz it puts them in the public light would she do it with her face or anonymous so far anonymous I mean eventually if she wants so she can put her face out there you know let's see how you cool things... with that yeah i don't have an issue with it okay I wonder what's like Here's a good the thing. Mm-hmm. If you don't let your partner actually take some risks, right? Then the, you know, they don't actually mature as much. Mhm. Cuz your girl is 22. What would you say her maturity level at this point is like? 22 year old girl's maturity level. Okay. She's mature, this. like she she is very understanding and mature, but she's also like a 22 year old, right? Mm-hmm. So she gets scared easily, there are emotions involved, things like that. So you have to keep things in balance because you can't put too much pressure on a 22 year old. I mean, they don't they just break, especially women, right? They just break very easily. They can't handle stress well. Do you guys have a lot to talk about? Oh yeah, we're from the same culture, right? We're from the same caste, same hometown. So we have a lot in common. Okay. Okay. To give you an example of what I mean about just being 22 is, you know, a few days ago, she had like, you know, when she was stretching in the gym, she started feeling some pain in her breast. And, you know, when she was touching it, she's like, okay, there's a bump here, and when I'm touching it, there's a bump there. So, you know, she got like very scared you know maybe i have breast cancer what the fuck and she spent like hours and hours crying and i'm like okay let's put an end to this let's go to the doctor and then we got one of those you know sonography scans done what's that word for it mammalia sonography whatever the fuck that's mammogram called. I don't know. mammogram no it was like a you know an ultrasound but on your boobs right okay okay And turns out there's nothing. It's just breast tissue, no big deal. You know, maybe it just got inflamed from a workout or something like that. But mm-hmm. she was very stressed about it. I mean, it wasn't something that should have needed immediate attention. I mean, you can wait two days and do it. But she was in so much stress about it that I had to get it done the same day. But if she was say, like, if that 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 reason that that, that she was stressed is that she's very young. But if she was five years older. then probably she would have been like okay fine maybe there's something there let me wait a day and then get it tested out like i, I wouldn't be like that stressed about it i see 
does her getting stressed force you to grow in certain ways or does it also make you stressed when she's stressed it doesn't make me stressed but you kind of have additional responsibilities right not only do you have to handle the situation but you also have to handle the person yes all while you still have your problems and your stresses as well that's why i tell guys like you got to be very mature when you're trying to get into a relationship because what happens with some guys is that you know they focus on the grind for a long time so they're focusing on their skill set their business building their empire so they're great in that but they don't have the maturity for relationships like conflict management active listening disagreeing without creating an enemy these are a lot of soft skills that they didn't really master as they were focusing on the grind so would you say that you've had the chance to master these soft skills or at least work on it i wouldn't say i've mastered them like that would be a a huge exaggeration mm-hmm. but yeah i've gotten much better at them over the years i've always been a more of a type a person you know if you do something wrong you would hear about it in the sense like what the fuck is this you know do it better yeah but you know in the last few years i've learned that it doesn't actually work well with people like i mean it works for a bit but then you're like you the, the people they just leave right your employee quits okay fuck it man i'm finding a better job where the boss doesn't yell at me i'm out so i've learned to manage it much much better but i tend to be someone who likes to do things well and that's a tendency i have you, you, i expect that from other people as well but not everybody can do that so a part of growing up or you know becoming wiser is understanding that you cannot expect what you would do yourself from other people i see what about the you know how men and women deal with problems differently where a lot of women just want to vent whenever they're talking about a problem and the guys want to immediately solve it have you gotten better at letting your girl vent to you rather than immediately trying to solve the problem That's something I always found difficult to do. Like in my mind, whenever I hear a problem, I'm like, you do X Y and Z solved. She's like, yeah, yeah, I get it. Now she's still continuing on with the problem. I'm like, I just gave you the resolution, execute it. But they just want to vent to you. I have had the situation with girls I've dated previously. With my mm-hmm. wife, haven't had the situation yet. I mean, no problem has shown up in her life yet where she would have to vent at least not so far. but what you're saying is a complete 100% true where you have to just let women talk just let her i mean they have the solution but in their brains they need to let it out and actually talk about it and then they feel better yes and women will do that with you if they're beginning to trust you so guys have to actually know that because a lot of guys they immediately want to solve the problem which is fine but they want to keep on talking about it with their partner and that for them is a way of building rapport where guys we don't really communicate like that we're not going to be venting for too long maybe it will have an off day every now and then but for the most part when we're talking about problems we want it resolved so there are two ways to like deal with problems uh, for anyone that's listening you got to assess which boat it's in does a person want to vent or does a person actually want the problem solved and if you misdiagnose the issue then you're going to plummet your likability Let's say someone wants to actually someone really wants the problem solved and you're just like mhm 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 they're going to view you as a dumbass but let's say someone wants to vent and you just keep giving solutions they're going to view you as um low social intelligence so you got to diagnose the issue correctly um th- yeah a lot of people misdiagnose this issue dude like um Like for example, I'll actually give you an example in real time. There was this one time when I like stacked up a bunch of parking tickets in undergrad and I couldn't register for new classes until I paid off this money. And it was like $1000, which for an undergrad student is a ton. I didn't know where the heck I was going to get that money. I was going to ask my dad for it because I didn't want him to like um he he could have done it, but I just didn't want to bother him with it. So I was going to my fraternity brother. He was my big brother in the fraternity. and i was telling him this problem right and i was telling him this problem looking for solutions so if he was just like mhm 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 then i would have been furious but he like listened and he's like call me back tomorrow he i called him back tomorrow and he's like your problem is resolved 
apparently he got a bunch of brothers to pitch in like five to ten dollars each and he raised enough money to pay off my ticket so he diagnosed that issue correctly so you got to really know how to diagnose the issue and people that really want solutions for their problems they'll keep asking like got any ideas got any ideas or someone who wants to vent they're never going to ask you got any ideas they're just going to ramble you see so that's how you tell the difference one Oh, I agree with everything you said. One mm -hmm. caveat though, and this is for all the guys out there. If you think someone's wet, you know, venting, you are not obligated to listen to it unless you're getting paid or if it's a girl who's sleeping with you. Mm. A lot of people will just try to waste your time, especially women you're not sleeping with, you know, the friend zone type of shit where this is using you to vent and I like. The Why emotional am I tampon. To your bullshit, you know, exactly. That's the mm -hmm. thing. Emotional tampon. If you're not sleeping with a girl, if you have not put your dick in her pussy, don't listen. Don't waste your time. Disconnect the call. Tell the girl, okay, oh, hey, I mean, sucks, but you know, that's life. And then change the topic. You, you would shouldn't waste your time listening to other people's problems if you're not getting paid for it and if you're not talking to the girl absolutely that's a really good caveat like you actually have to be dating the person or getting paid by the person otherwise you don't because these this is where guys make a mistake they think if i'm an emotional tampon long enough then she'll trust me and then by trusting me i could get with her which is such a bad way to play it because she's just going to abuse you it's kind of like in a social interaction if you're rambling all the time and the other person is just like doing this the entire time in the future whenever they want to talk and you've been rambling and you feel good, you're going to get annoyed that they want to talk and they want to take that spotlight away from you rambling. So I tell people like, hey, you got to insert yourself in the conversation. And for folks that are like just constantly just being this emotional tampon, I'm like, dude, if you're not getting anything out of it, dip. Leave the scenario. A lot of people are like that. I'm surprised how, how many men are just total dorks. I'm telling you, the... There are some guys out there who will listen to women talk about their boyfriend. You know, my boyfriend is such a jerk. He doesn't treat me nicely. And, you know, this guy is like, you know, in his mind, he's like, you know, I'm the perfect boyfriend for you. And he's, <laughs> you know, the girl will be saying things like, I want a guy just like you. And this guy is like, in his mind, hey, I'm right too. But really, I mean... <laughs> You're not respectable, dude. What the fuck? Who the fuck has time to listen to a woman's bullshit? <laughs> Were you ever like that? Did you ever have like a simp state? No, no. I was always an asshole. I was always like, shut the fuck up. Like, I, I would literally tell women, I don't care. Like, that sounds like your problem. Was there a like a close relative of yours that was like that? I have been an asshole to everybody. Like, I just don't let people waste my time. I'm literally telling you. No, I've no, told no, this no, to I, my I, friends, I, I, family, I'm, everybody. I'm, like, if you need not, a solution, come to me. Stop wasting my time. Now I'm saying, do you, did you ever have like a brother, a cousin, or someone that was like an emotional tampon? No, I mean, not that I'm aware of. Probably I do, but I'm not super involved in everybody's life to know. It's so annoying to break the news to them. I had a cousin like that. He was such a freaking simp. And he's always like crying over girls, like doing exactly what you were just talking about. Like, like listening to the girl that he loves, like whining about her boyfriend to him. And I would just be blunt. I'm like, dude, you are such a weakling, man. You got to like toughen up. I'm actually embarrassed to be having the same blood as you. I'm thinking the tough love is going to work. And he's just, uh, he's just like, you just don't get it, Armani. Like I'm romantic. And I'm like, no, you're not romantic. You're a loser. And it's so hard to break through that, their mind because they actually think they're being romantic. It's a psyop. The whole concept of being romantic is a psyop. It's a psyop. You know, it's like the romantic guy gets the girl after we sleep with him. Mm, dang. Are like you once romantic? Once she becomes 29 and, you know, she's run out of guys who are willing to sleep with her. And now she's like, if I wait three more years, I probably won't get married. So now she's looking for a romantic guy who treats her right in conditions. <laughs> <laughs> so romance is bullshit. What about with your girl? Do you ever show some romance? Do you ever buy her flowers and stuff? I might. I haven't done that yet. I, mean, I might just do it for the sake of doing it every once in a while. But 
it's not me you know it's not my personality to buy flowers did you do anything for valentine's day no do you ever do anything for valentine's day no did you get any criticism from your wife i do what did you get any criticism from your wife for not doing anything for valentine's day no she gets it you know she's smart okay um what about like your parents does your dad like take your mama to dinner or something no okay okay so you're like you guys are completely disconnected we're smart you know we don't get into this whole bullshit because the moment you start doing things like that right women's expectations go way up it is something that i get it it's one of those like artificially created days but here at least man it's just it's one of those things bro like you kind of have to do because if you don't do it now like all your girl's friends are like oh my boyfriend did this my boyfriend did that and if you don't do anything for your girls now it's just like this silent resentment she may not vocalize it immediately but she's going to be like oh my friends got this my friends got that so i do something for valentine's day yeah that makes sense see in your culture this day is a little more special because you know you're in a christian country in mm-hmm. india no one really gives a fuck it's one of those mm-hmm. shopping discount days <laughs> pretty much one of those shopping discount days but other than you and your like family what about the rest of the culture does anyone like do stuff for valentine's day not particularly i mean people might go out for dinner but not people don't do much for valentine's day it's not a part of our culture right like we have muslims hindus they don't give a fuck about valentine's day i see okay that makes sense plus it's too crowded you know if you go out on valentine's day it's a little like you don't get as good service as you get if you went out one day after one day before mhm yeah during this recent valentine's day bro i realized how much i hate drop shipping did you notice that drop shipping just died out of nowhere drop shipping was like a a thing that worked well in 2018 19 mm-hmm. but hasn't worked well since this recent valentines um i ended up a week before valentines i'm scrolling through instagram and i see this amazing gift idea uh, i'm not going to say the gift idea because you'll see why shortly but it's this amazing gift idea i see an ad on instagram i go on the listing page i purchase it and i'm thinking okay so, since i ordered this 7 days before it should arrive on valentines day to my partner and i'm still being generous i'm thinking it should arrive sooner but i'm just saying 7 days because you know like maybe low shipping costs bad weather etc it's february 23rd 2024 and the product still hasn't arrived. So I hit up their customer support like a week ago and I'm like, "What the hell, man? The purpose of this gift was for it to arrive on Valentine's Day. It's still not there." And this is when this guy's like responding back to me in a very like creepy sort of text, like overly polite, "Sir, we got your gift um order. It's on its way." And he gave me this tracking um uh, link. I go on the tracking link and i see that the product is being shipped from mainland china and i'm like oh no wonder it's taking so long it's one of these drop shipping products that are being shipped from china i didn't know that from the listing page but i'm starting to see how annoying it is and in 2018 there was this one guy who was like this shopify pro he was hosting a lot of these periscopes and his audience was asking i mean i get like the entire business model but do people really want to wait 3 to 4 weeks for their product and the shopify guru was like well yeah i mean if you over communicate that's more than fine and i'm calling bullshit on that bro i don't think anyone wants to wait 3 to 4 weeks for a product um it's just a big nuisance and if they'll do it once chances are they will never do it again it's just way too long yeah 3 4 weeks is too much but we've kind of become spoiled by amazon same day wanted delivery i mean that's a real amazon level thing you can't expect a small store to be able to match that mm-hmm. i would say 5 6 7 days is i would be okay waiting 5 days but not like 3 weeks yes i did hear though that nowadays drop shippers like they're capable of importing their products to the us to do like the 5 to 7 day shipping rather than the 3 to 4 weeks but you're right man we got spoiled by amazon so anything over same day or 3 days is too much 
I will say one thing about the whole drop shipping thing though. Even after waiting for four weeks, the product usually sucks. Mm-hmm. Ah, oh, dang, man. Well, the, I, I hope the product that I got doesn't suck. But <laughs> no, it, when I say it sucks, I mean it sucks. For example, like a lot of drop shipped stuff is like people buying something for one dollar, selling it for fifteen, twenty dollars. But at the end of the day, the stuff was actually manufactured for less than a dollar. It's not gonna be good. Let's say you buy like straps for your watch. Or something like that. It's not gonna be high quality, despite you paying twenty bucks for it. Because out of that, nineteen dollars was like gross profit. It doesn't have good manufacturing costs. The products tend to be very cheap, very low quality, and it's just not a. I I, I as a customer, I would not want to buy something from a dropship store. Yes, and there's a lot of deceit involved because when I was making that purchase. Not for a second did I think this was a dropship store. So most people that are purchasing from one of these dropshipping guys have no clue that they're purchasing a product straight from China. Yeah, that's the thing, right? I don't consider that to be unethical because even when you buy from Apple, you're buying a product straight from China. I mean, mm-hmm. it's not like Apple is manufacturing in the U.S. Everything is made in China. It's not their fault that everything is made in China. So you cannot well, blame them for this. Everything is made in China. Well, that that's not the problem. I don't actually care if it's made from China. My problem is the lack of transparency in the wait time that it's being delivered from China. If I order an Apple iPhone and it's taking like a month to get here, I'm going to feel a certain type of way. I don't really care where it's made as long as it's functioning and whatever. I care about the wait time though. The wait time needs to be communicated properly. I mean... You got to tell people it's going to take six weeks. If it's going to take four weeks, tell them it's going to take four weeks. Don't make it sound like it's going to come in two days. So yeah, that definitely needs to be a thing. That but the if first you want to throw this guy, you know, try returning the product after you get it. Tell them that, okay, this product sucks. I want to return it. Uh, nah, man. That's, <laughs> that's just going to uh, that's just gonna make it feel like I wasted these past four weeks. Um, no, what's going to happen is that this guy... So this product, he's buying it for one dollar, right? But it's selling, he's selling it for twenty bucks. So instead of paying a return fee, he's probably gonna be like, okay, just keep the product. I see. Yeah, I mean, I haven't seen a business model die as quick as drop shipping in recent ages. It's not dead. It's not dead. It's very. It's a good business model for a lot of people for a lot of products. Mm-hmm. It's just that some people don't know how to do it well, and it the customer experience is so negative they tend to think that all dropship products suck right but how often do you see people talking about it like they did in 2018 it was a viral business model thing because it's a very easy business to start i can i i, I see with i see few people selling courses about it but that doesn't mean drop shipping stores are not making money they're making a ton of money yeah i can see like the top players making money but I wonder if it's a good business model just like uh, to tell people to get into. It's not because it takes too much money to start. You're going to take you like at least five grand to start. And, you know, probably your first tour is going to bomb. It's not going to do well. So mm-hmm. I wouldn't recommend getting into the physical product business anyway. Like you sell a product worth, let, let's say that your monthly sales are $10,000. Your profits are going to be 1500 bucks. So you might get happy. I made 10 grand in sales, but how much did you actually make from that? 15K. So it's not like a very money-rich business. I wouldn't recommend it as such. Mm-hmm. It's mainly um, knowing how to media buy sort of business. Because in 2018, what was the game? You set up a uh, a website, you run Facebook traffic to it, to a product from China, and then you just generate your job is to think of unique marketing angles to generate sales for warehouses in China. And then Facebook became really strict and then different ad platforms started to emerge. Like nowadays, that product that I bought was from Instagram ads. Um, I guess TikTok ads is also a thing. So now different ad platforms are coming up, uh, but that's when it becomes tricky because now you got to make sure that you're thinking of unique marketing angles. And it's like an appropriate budget that you can still make profit from. It's best if you own like your own traffic, like you have like a blog and stuff like that. But that takes way longer to generate sales versus just direct ads. 
I think the bigger thing, the bigger issue with dropshipping is that 90% of the time, right, you can find the exact same product on Amazon because a lot of these dropshippers, they're like, okay, fuck it. Let me just import like a thousand units of this and sell it on Amazon FBA. Mm -hmm. So if you're like buying a weighing scale, you can find the same weighing scale being sold for 20 bucks on a dropshipping store. And that exact same product will be available on Amazon for $3, same day shipping. Exactly, man. You've never done an Amazon business, have you? Not really, man. I have not. It's just one of those things I don't want to get into. It's just not that profitable. Did you ever want to release a physical product for Life Math Money brand? It will probably be some kind of book, like a physical book, not some kind of product. I mean, I might you... do it at some point in the future. Who knows what I'll do in the future, but... Would you ever do merchandise? Like jackets, t-shirts? There are no plans of that as of yet. I might at some point. Who knows? Mm -hmm. What's cool is that like the print-on-demand services like Teespring, where you don't actually have to buy the jacket or anything. You just give them your design. So hypothetically, let's just say you use... What is it? Chanakya? Is that how you say his name? Chanakya, Chanakya. Um, if you just put his face on like, a, what do you call it? A hoodie, right? In Teespring. And someone orders that hoodie, they'll fulfill it. So all you're really responsible for is getting traffic onto the listing page. But you don't have warehouse costs or anything. So print on demand is something I can stand behind. I'm just not a big fan of like getting your product from China and like making people wait six weeks for it. I think you had a big negative experience. That's coloring your thought about it. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. Waiting six weeks for a product is a bit overkill. But I just feel like I was lied to, bro. Where like not for a second did anyone say. Uh, and by the way, I will grant you the point that there are a lot of dropshipping stores that do work. A lot of them are transparent from the very beginning. Like, hey, our manufacturer is like overseas, so it's going to take longer than usual. I, I grant you that. But my thing is, um, the product that I ended up buying, I'm pretty sure if I did a little bit more research and I was aware, like, hey, this is a dropshipping product, I could have found one in US. It would have been a little bit more expensive, but I could have gotten it in like a couple of days. So I just didn't like how I was lied to or like information was just left out where it was. It turned out to be a lie. So, um, uh, okay. Would, yeah. you, would your thoughts be different if you were aware that this shipping time would be six weeks? Yeah, if it was six weeks, I wouldn't have, first of all, I wouldn't have even bought it. And then, yeah, it would have been neutral. I wouldn't have like a good experience or a bad experience with it because I wouldn't have bought it. I'm not going to buy a product that takes six weeks to get here unless it's an amazing product and I'm getting an amazing deal. This gift is like a pretty good like product, but it's not like amazing. Like, oh my God, I'm going to wait six weeks for it. So you would have been neutral about it if you were aware how much time it would take. It's not just, it's not China. It's more like, I mean, I expected it to come tomorrow and it came like a long time later. Yeah. yeah. As I said, I don't really care where the product is made from as long as it's working. I care about the wait time. Exactly. The wait time sucks. I agree with you. Although yeah. sometimes it's the only option you have. For example, I have a mechanical keyboard mm -hmm. and I had to wait, wait like two months to get it because it had to be shipped from China. Okay. And if they say it, bro, that's all I'm saying. Like, if you just communicate with me, you just say like, hey, bro, it's going to take a little bit of time. And then it's like, all right, you know. Um, but when you don't say it, you just kind of like give me a receipt and that's it. And then it doesn't show up on like Valentine's Day. Then I feel a certain type of way. Interesting, though, man. Um, what's your like thoughts on courses, though? Do you think that's still like a good way to make money? It kind of depends, right? If you know what you're talking about, it's a great way to make money if you are actually providing some value in your course. But the, the era where you could just suddenly show up one day and say, hey, I'm the most expert copywriter in the world. Here is my course, $10,000. Yeah, that's bullshit. That's not working. Didn't work back then. Doesn't work now. Mm -hmm. Are you still on Gumroad? I am on Gumroad, yes. How's your like opinions on Gumroad nowadays? It seems like they're rolling out some new features recently. Yeah, they are. It's a pretty okay company. They are doing some work now. Mm -hmm. I still think that the fee is a little overpriced. Gotcha, gotcha. 
Yeah, man, there's a lot of these different business models nowadays. I wonder what the future is. Have you seen these VR headsets show up now? I saw it from Apple, and apparently Facebook has one too now. I'm interested in seeing how well they actually work and how, what's the word for it, how practical they are. It would be cool if they, there could be like some kind of spectacles or something with some VR capabilities like Dragon Ball Z type stuff. Mm -hmm. Would you buy one of those? I would buy one of those, yes. You haven't already bought one? I thought like for some reason you or you would have bought one by now. No, I haven't bought one yet. I mean, the current ones are not that usable because they're too heavy. You cannot actually go out with them. Mm -hmm. What I mean is some kind of natural looking thing that do, doesn't look like a piece of technology. I mean, something very, very simple. Like you wear, a, you wear a pair of sunglasses and you can do things like take a photo for you or some kind of thing, you know, like display some some TV or something to you. For example, let's say that you want to watch a documentary while you're out walking. You should be able to do that with those sunglasses or mm. check some kind of email or something. So I, it would be pretty cool if that technology does happen, but it needs to be like a sunglass or some kind of very lightweight thing that you can wear easily, not some, not this heavy shit. Yeah, this is where like fashion and technology need to merge. Have you seen those things that Google discontinued? Google Google eyeglasses or something like that? Yeah, I saw that, a nerdy but page really wearing it. Yeah, they were too nerdy with it. Like they need a little bit of that Apple flair. Um, what about a Fitbit? Do you have one of those? I have a Samsung watch. Okay. Um, does it look good? Yep. Samsung watch six, I think. Yeah, it looks pretty good. Oh, so I bought a Fitbit in the beginning of this year, dude. And it's been such, I actually bought it for my birthday to set the right tone for this birthday. Um, and it, it's so clutch, man. Like where you just codify everything, you know, how much calories you're burning, you know, when your blood, uh, what your blood pressure is, all of that stuff. It's so detailed and it's completely it can changed. blood pressure or something like our heart rate or something like that. Heart rate. Yeah. Um, it's completely changed my perception of, tr um, parking lots where before if I saw a packed parking lot, I'd be pissed. I'm like, what's up with all these people here at 11 in the morning? And, and I'd be annoyed to park in the back. Nowadays, with the Fitbit, everything feels like a game. So if I park all the way in the back, I'm like, yes, I get more steps in. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I have the same exact same experience. I'm telling you. So before I got a smartwatch, mm -hmm. I used to think it's all bullshit. I mean, who the fuck wants to charge a new thing? But then I got a smartwatch free with the phone. And then, you know, I'm wearing it and I'm sitting on my computer all day at work. And I look at my watch and I'm like, Okay, so I've only walked 2,000 steps today. So it made me realize how little I was actually walking on so many days. So that made me start walking more. And the thing is that with, you do it for a few days and then you set a goal. Okay, I'm going to walk 10,000 steps every single day. And then you try to get steps in out of small things. Like let's say that you're going to go to the washroom. Okay, but then you take a big round while coming back. You don't come back the the short route. You come back the exactly, long Exactly, exactly, dude. And you know what I realized from having this Fitbit? Getting 10,000 steps in a day, it actually requires effort. Where I thought before, like having this Fitbit, I'm like, oh yeah, 10,000 uh, steps a day. I'm sure I'd do that. I wasn't doing anything close to that. But once I got this, now I know for a fact when I hit 10,000 steps. Do you ever hit more than 10,000? Typically, I will be somewhere between 15 and 20,000. When I climbed up this mountain called Stone Mountain, I got 18,000 steps that day. Like throughout the entire oh. day. Okay. So typically what I do is I'll walk one hour in the morning. That's going to take care of about 6,000 steps. And I walk one hour after dinner. That takes care of 6,000 more steps. That's 12,000. And typically somewhere when I'm in the gym or, you know, here and there, I'll walk a little bit and it's going to be about 18, 20,000. But there are also days that I'm working all day and I've only walked like, 8,000 steps. That does happen sometimes. These one hour walks that you're doing, is it in a park or are you just like going about your day and you're walking for one hour? Yeah, I mean, stuff like, you know, you go to the park or somewhere and you just walk or let's say you're at a restaurant 
and okay i'm like you tell the restaurant okay i'm going to order this food call me when it's ready and then you go walk a little bit things like that i see okay so i do what you're talking about in the morning i'll do one of those one hour walks and if you do that chances are throughout your day you're going to hit 10000 if you're just living day to day in life but you do that one hour walk in the morning you're good to hit 10000 steps um if you're doing two one hour walks like you're doing you're definitely going to hit over 10000 steps but i do think for guys you got to hit at least 10000 because it's the easiest way to burn fat like your body loves to walk and it's just such a, so many benefits of it too like you get creative thoughts it's therapeutic you're out in nature it's just a good habit to pick up and i would not have even thought about it unless i got this fitbit it's Walking the fitbit does inspire model by the faster. way mm-hmm. it does help you lose fat faster yes yeah, i think it burns like rate. 300 calories every 10000 steps yes exactly i think it's way better than like going for too many runs are you a runner not particularly and i don't really enjoy running me either man i hate running it's not very good for you either it kind of it's very catabolic it starts hitting your muscle in the bad way mm-hmm. we don't really recommend doing it and doesn't really burn as many calories too because you can't run for an hour you can't dude even our ancient ancestors when they were going from one place to another they had to walk a lot so i think it's in us um I had this tweet where I said what journaling is for the mind walking is for the body because I notice when I don't walk I just feel hazy like I don't have good thoughts coming in I don't get much ideas but when I intentionally start off my morning off with that 1 hour walk and by the way dude I'm addicted to it like whenever I don't do it my body feels a certain type of way so that's like a good ritual in my morning like I start off with that activity A lot of creative. Have you noticed that when walk. you walk too much, you're a little bit more hungry? Yes. Yep. And if you've been doing it for a series of days, now your metabolism is just moving fast. So you'll eat and automatically you're hungry again. You have to be careful with that. A lot of people think that just because they're walking more, they're burning calories and they're losing weight, mm-hmm. which may be true, but typically you just get a little more hungry, you eat a bit more. and you're back to neutral you have to be careful to not eat more because you're walking yes did you ever see how much calories you burn after a workout like a where you're weightlifting yeah the watch is going to give you some bullshit number typically a weightlifting workout is going to burn 50 60 calories but these watches these fitbits they'll tell you like you're burning hundreds of calories which is not true Really? I thought you burn at least 273 270 calories for a no 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 you don't work out. You're going to burn like 100 calories at best. Because what mm. are you doing? Let's say you're doing like bicep curls. That doesn't take that many calories. It's hard to do it, but it's it's hard because the limiting thing is strength. It's not burning calories. Okay, but what if you're doing like pull-ups, push-ups, squats for 30 minutes intense? How many push-ups are you doing? 50. How many calories does it take to do one push-up? Half. I have no clue. Most, like maybe like 1/4 of a calorie. I don't know, bro. I think if you uh, like lift weights for 30 minutes intense, you could burn 200 calories. See, to burn 200 calories, you have to walk quite a bit. Not not walking, not walking. I'm talking about working out, like lifting weights. Yeah, it doesn't burn that many calories. It doesn't. It's good for building muscle, but it's not good for burning calories. You sure, bro? Yes. Okay, okay. I, I could um vigorous weightlifting for 30 minutes may burn between 180 to 252 calories. This is from Medical News today, so I don't know how reliable they are. Now we should bring Matt Stevens on and ask him. Cuz I oh, really yeah, thought course. No, I thought like intense weightlifting like um cuz I I measure it like intense weightlifting or like bodyweight workouts. I I burned 250 and I think that's pretty accurate. You're saying it's like 50ish? It's close to 100 down to down to, you know, 250. It's 
pretty close to 100 not not 250 see you have to swim for 30 that, minutes bro. straight like vigorous swimming to burn 250 calories so no bro i'm willing to bet you on this let's do a public bet let's let's do it Let, i'm gonna say okay. say how much did you say 40 minutes of okay 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 let's put it like this 30 minutes of intense working out with weights involved body weights involved how much are you saying that is 100 i'm saying it's 250 but we need to define the intense workout because when i'm thinking of intense workouts i'm thinking of you know heavy weights like let's say you're doing heavy squats for 5 10 reps if you're doing like 200 air squats you're probably burning quite a few calories okay so what are you defining it as like what's the squats on like there's like weights on it and stuff right yeah and it's I'm, like pretty heavy think of something like let's say in the 40 minutes you did like you had 140 kilos in the squats you did like three sets of 10 reps and then you did like your bicep exercises then you did like maybe some deadlift or something maybe like five six exercises with heavier weights that's how I define like an intense workout. But if you're doing, like, if your workout is like cardio-ish, you know, yeah, where you're doing yeah. like 100 air squats, then definitely you're going to burn more because it's cardio. No, what you were just describing, that's what I'm talking about. The first thing yeah, you were describing. Yeah, that, the doesn't intense that, many that doesn't burn that many calories. I think it does, bro. I think it does. I think it's at least, what you were describing, I would say it's 250. Like what I, uh, like that's what I would define as intense. Like like you're breaking a sweat, you're lifting weights, you're pushing your body, you're doing hypertrophy, all of that stuff. I see 250, not 100. It's closer to 100. We can, yeah, let, let's do some more research about it. But I'm, I'm telling you this number from, so I have a big sheet that I maintain, which contains how many steps I walked that day, whether I trained that day or not, and how many calories I ate. And I try to fit in how many, how much weight I lost in that month with what I ate and I've discovered the math. The math is a little like this where typically if I don't do anything, if I'm just sitting on my computer all day, doing nothing like zero steps, I'll burn like 2,200 calories just by sitting. Maybe 2,300, okay. but like closer to 2,200. Mm -hmm. If I add in 10,000 steps, then I'll burn like 325, 300 calories per 10,000 steps. And you know, this is like, that's in isolation, accurate. because typically if you Google how many calories you burn in 10,000 steps, they tend to add their BMR to the not time. For example, you know, let's say that you are, you're, if you do nothing all day, you burn 2,400 calories, for example, right? And mm -hmm. it takes one hour to walk 6,000 steps. Then typically what these calculators do is that they say, okay, it takes you one hour to burn, to walk 6,000 steps. So one hour, just by being alive, you would have burned 100 calories, right? Okay, right. So they, they add that 100 to the step activity. Okay, gotcha. Um, so, I mean, what I mean to say is that I will burn 300 additional calories to just being alive if I walk 10,000 steps. Right, right. Like 10,000, like, okay. Yeah, I think our numbers are a little different Um, because I don't really know what you do in a day. Like even like like a day where you're not doing any sort of activity, you're saying that baseline is 2200. I see like for yeah. your body type, it would be more around the 2400 range. 2200 seems kind of light. How, how much do you weigh now? Right now I'm at like 82 maybe. The thing is that these are like estimates, right? Because I, I eat Indian food. So mm -hmm. when I'm tracking weight, you know, wheat flour and things like that, it might actually have more calories than what the tracking app suggests. I'm just giving yeah. you consistent numbers that I use for my app. Yeah, I'm just thinking like on a lazy day, like you're, let's say you're just sitting on your butt the entire day, you're getting up every now and then to use the restroom, like just a no, basic I mean stuff. zero steps, zero steps, like literally zero steps. Okay, zero steps. Okay, yeah, I don't know about that because I, I never measure it like that, but I mean it like you're not doing anything active for the day. You're just kind of taking a day off. For a guy that's 82 kg, which is 180 pounds, I'm thinking like just if you're living an average day without any exercise or whatever, I'm thinking you'd at least burn 2,400 calories throughout the day just by you existing. And then you possibly, like, I mean, the, the yeah. thing with these calorie numbers is that it depends on the app you're using because some apps will have like more calories for the same thing. For example, 
you know, millets will have a little more calories in some app, less calories in some app. You just got to be a bit more consistent. What I mean is, I will burn, say, 2200 calories just by existing, at least from my calculations, 300 by doing walk and about 50 to 100 with my workout. Yeah, because I'm like looking at mine, like the rest days where I I didn't get much walks in the days. I was just resting like 24, 49 calories burned that day, 25, 97 calories burned that day. Where are you checking this? Um, Fitbit, the Fitbit app. It doesn't know that. It's an estimate. It's an estimate, but like I'm trying to look for like a general pattern. These estimates can be off by like a five six hundred calorie mark. Don't trust these estimates. I don't know about five six hundred calorie mark, bro. That's like uh, then like I don't think anyone would take Fitbit seriously. No, not you because you're sure the regular body type. But if someone's obese, these mm. or if someone's like really really skinny, these are just they're just using some formula to figure out what your daily BMR and everything is, and then doing some math based on it it's not like a you're not getting yeah. like a very scientific number here yeah i don't need like exact numbers but i need like just rough metrics to see if i'm on the right track or not um you see what i'm saying so i think in that regards fitbit is pretty on point at least for my body type i don't know man at least the samsung watch is complete bullshit about the Sam- type of stuff. Dude, samsung watch and the iphone thing it's complete bullshit my mom um has the iphone one and um she like walked a lot of like steps throughout the day and it just wrote like two, two steps apparently. So it's very <laughs> unscientific, but Fitbit, bro, I'm telling you, you got to actually, you should actually invest in one um, just to try it out. And it's way more specific than one of these like smart watches. I don't know. I don't want to wear two things in my hand, at least for yeah. now. Yeah. See, that's one of the, that's one of the things that I've noticed with Fitbits. Like I have this nice watch collection. I haven't been able to wear it since I got this. Yeah, man, it kind of defeats the purpose because that thing looks like shit, to be honest with you. You think it looks like shit? I thought it looked kind of fresh, man. It kind of looks like one of those rubber bands where the girls put in their head. Ah, uh, what? Dang, man, you just roasted me. <laughs> there's, an- <laughs> <laughs> there's another I mean, one. That's the reason I don't ring. wear it. Yeah, there's another I one that's a ring. Yeah, that one's pretty good, I've heard. Yeah. But at least the Samsung watch gives bullshit numbers about calories because I once wore it when I was surfing. And, mm-hmm. you know, I surf for like two hours. And you don't burn that many calories while surfing. You just don't because half the time you're in water. Okay. Just okay. So this, the, for a wave. Thus and according to the talk- watch, I burned like 1,700 calories, which is bullshit. No, no. Thus far, you've been talking about the Samsung watch. And Apple Watch falls under the same category. Those are BS. What I'm talking about is Fitbit. And I think that's way more like specific. One thing also, dude, the Fitbit tells you is like your sleep. My sleep sucks. Do you ever measure your sleep? I did for a few days when I got the watch and it was new and I wanted to see all the features. But then after a while, they're like, why the fuck am I doing this? You know, it's not like I'm changing anything about it. Dude, whenever, one thing I've noticed, um, I'm still playing around with the idea, but I think eight hours of sleep is overrated. I will... I have to hard disagree on that. Disagree. I, I'm not very creative. I don't sleep. I need like nine, nine and a half hours of sleep. That's a lot, bro. I need six. If I could get six to seven, then I'm good. I sleep a lot, man. I, I can't even describe it, you know. Because it's a little embarrassing, but I sleep a lot. I sleep like nine hours, ten hours. I need a decent amount of sleep. Are you serious? Okay, so and are you a fast sleeper? Sort of. It depends. But typically I sleep like in 20 minutes do you snore no you don't snore okay at least i haven't had any complaints from the wife about it possibly i do it and she tolerates it but haven't heard anything about it man bro you sleep a lot you actually sleep more than like the the average person i've been like this ever since i was a kid like i've always liked to sleep like i was always late to class because i was sleeping too much (laughs) (laughs) do you uh like remember your dreams I fucked it up once by keeping a dream journal and I actually started remembering my dreams to the point where it would actually be a little head fucky because I could not tell the difference if something happened in my sleep, like in a dream or it happened in real life. It Mm -hmm. could be something like I borrowed a book from somebody, but in a dream, I returned it to them. 
but then I didn't remember the dream because I was keeping the dream journals. I was getting very good at remembering them. And then later the guy was asking me for the book and I'm like, I gave it back to you. What are you on about? And he's like, no, really? you Really? What the heck, dude? That's actually, yeah. Uh, yeah, so I stopped you... keeping that dream journal and I'm like, okay, I don't want to remember my dreams. Fuck this bullshit. They have classes on that lucid dreaming. I tried doing that. It didn't work out so well. It I mean, I had one lucid dream and I was like flying in a parachute, but it seems highly overrated. Mm, do you have a lot of nightmares? No, only when I take magnesium. Yeah, magnesium is one of those things that has never worked for me. Fuck magnesium. Every time I take magnesium, I just get a nightmare. Why do you take magnesium? I'm just trying it out. Okay. Does it is this something that helps you sleep better? No, it's one of those supplements that was very popular on Twitter. So I'm like, okay, let me try this stuff out. Let's see how it is. Mm -hmm. And didn't have a good experience with it. How about you? With what, magnesium or dreaming? Both. Magnesium, no, I don't. I try to avoid too many supplements. As of late, I don't even drink like protein drinks and stuff anymore. I, I want everything like from food or like something like that. Um, as for the dreams, there was a period I did remember my dreams in detail. And I noticed I was remembering my dreams once I began writing. Once I began writing, it's as though I had a different relationship with my mind. Where pre-writing, my mind was just a bunch of random thoughts. Post-writing, um, it's like I had this intimate connection with it. And I would just remember a lot of these dreams. And one day in my newsletter, I like wrote about a dream that I remember in detail. It was basically um, this teacher that was like yelling at this student but the student wasn't me and i was just writing this newsletter out and there were three of my readers who actually did lucid dreaming classes and they all gave me an analysis of what that dream meant and they all said the same things even though they're from three different parts of the world they were like let's let me think like were you like a really bad student growing up i was like yes and then they were like just analyzing it so i was like wait a minute Three completely different people had the same exact interpretation on a dream that I had. There may be some method to this madness on this like lucid dream analysis thing. So I got curious about it. But it's one of those things that I never invested more in because there's certain things I don't want to know too much about. I just want to experience it, then move on with it. I would say dreaming is one of those things. I don't I feel like if I know too much about it, then I'm going to overthink too much. I'm like, what did that dream mean? What about that one? And I'm going to eventually start seeing things that aren't there. I think a lot of these analysis stuff has that problem where you just start assuming things about yourself or you, that's a, in Hindi, I don't know how to put it in English. Mm -hmm. Let me, let me think. Like in Hindi, the word is vehem, but in English, let me think what's the right word. You know, where you just form some kind of weird opinion mm -hmm. and then it becomes like a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yes, exactly. That's what I thought. Because they were like saying, that, like they were like predicting my future and all of that. And it eventually started to seem like palm reading or something like that. And I'm not a big fan of those kind of stuff because it sometimes is accurate. And that sometimes it being accurate makes you think that it could always be accurate. You see? And then you just start going into delusional territory. Hey, everything is sometimes accurate, you know. Exactly. Right? Like, are you like into like the like the astrology and the palm reading that sort of stuff? I think it's largely bullshit, but I can see that it'll give low IQ people some kind of hope. For example, recently I was at the mall, and there was a fat lady doing these things where it's called uh, tarot card reading. And uh, she has like two girls sitting on her desk. So basically she's like, they had two clients paying her 200, 300 rupees per question. So about three to $5 per question. And I was very curious. So I went close to them just to listen in on the conversation. I wanted to see what they're asking the fortune teller. Mm -hmm. And they're asking things like, when am I going to get married? Is it going to be a guy I already know? Or am I going to meet that guy in the future? And I'm like, how the fuck are you expecting? <laughs> 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 
there is a market for that, like single folks that are really curious about their future partner. <laughs> Who gives a fuck? I can't believe this bitch is spending money on this type of stuff. And, you know, I was very jealous, you know, the fact that people can make money with such simple stuff. I mean, this is a business which takes zero infrastructure. It's like a booth. <laughs> and all this chick is doing is like, you know, tarot card reading. She has like a pack of cards in her hand. And that's it, you know. <laughs> I mean, they had to, they had to like apparently learn it. Like apparently, like these people take this stuff really seriously. And like, I noticed a lot of girls start learning it after a very traumatic breakup or a divorce. Do you believe in this whole fortune telling stuff? Nah, hell no, nah, bro. I I would be lying though if I wasn't spooked out every now and then. Because there was this one girl I knew. I think I told you the story before. Like she was doing the tarot card reading on me, and she was like really accurate about stuff that I was like, "How the hell did you know that?" And she kind of like looked at me like, like in this really creepy way. I'm like, "You're a witch. Get the hell out of here." Nah, man. Like that kind of stuff. Um, it it just it makes you really delusional over time. Like that's kind of stuff you want to avoid. And it's actually a red flag in a partner. If your partner is like, oh, I act a certain way because, you know, I'm a Scorpio. You really want to view that as a red flag because in the future, they may do something that you consider very sinister and they try to explain it away with their astrology sign. So these people lose touch with reality very fast. Hey, man, all women are like that. I'm yet to meet a single woman who doesn't like know her astrology sign and things like that very very few women are like that most women care about this stuff i don't know why mm -hmm. but women care about this stuff and i'm telling you you can totally troll them for example you know you can ask them what's your star sign and you know then just reject them and it kind of makes them like very into you oh <laughs> it sounds like you're speaking from experience <laughs> I have a friend who's memorized, you know, which star sign is compatible with which star sign. And apparently that works very well for him. Personally, I would just like, if I'm, you know, on like a second, third date, I'm just trying to have fun. It was like a joke. You know, sometimes you just memorize some jokes and it helps you on every single day, build rapport type of things. Right. Like a lot of those things are like that. For example, I would do this palm touching thing to measure who has longer fingers, but I would do it with every girl. It's like an easy way to break the touch barrier. So mm -hmm. one of those, you know, disqualification things I would do is, okay, like, which star sign are you? And then I would just say, okay, that sucks. And then I would like just get a little disinterested for some time. She's going to ask like, what's up? Like, then I just say something like, okay, that, you know, I never work out with people from this star sign. So you, you're using it as a flirt, flirtatious technique. Yeah, I would just use it as a technique to disqualify her, you know. Basically, what you're trying to communicate is that one, you date a lot of girls. I mean, otherwise, how would you know this type of stuff? Like, it doesn't work out with you with the star sign. Mm -hmm. Second thing, what you're trying to do is like, okay, you don't need her. You can get more girls. I mean, you, you're already rejecting her. So she has to work a bit harder if she wants you. And can't technique, typically does make them work much more harder. Yeah, I think girls like this, it's fine. Because um, I did notice like, you are right in terms of a lot of girls do get interested in this, but a lot of girls grow out of it. And then eventually they're like, okay, this is something that it was fine to like be aware of, but now I got to grow up. And that's something you as a guy really need to factor in. Or if you're hooking up with girls like this that are like very into star signs, astrology, that's fine. But if this is something that like is a big central part of their life, which it is, like a lot of these people, like they get crystals, they do the tarot cards, all of that stuff. You really want to like factor that in where a lot of guys just gloss over it. But that's something that just keeps presenting itself again in the relationship. So that could be something that automatically should be a deal breaker where for me, like I never like encountered people like that, but I do know uh, like individuals where this was a reoccurring theme. Like, no, 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 we can't go here because my star sign says this. I can't have kids on this date because my like this becomes like this problem solving mechanism that they have in their mind and if you're trying to look for the data and they already have like this pre-established notion in their mind it's going to cause a lot of problems so it's fine to fool around with them but be very wary of like being serious with them especially if you're completely against astrology and all of that
I agree with you in the sense that if a girl's too obsessive about it, you can just like, you know, it's a red flag. I mean, if she actually makes real life decisions based on the stuff, it's a red flag. But most girls like to indulge in it, you know, for just for fun. It's one of those things yeah. they like to do. Yeah. You I can what have a lot of fun with the stuff, is. though. You can, like, I've done stuff like this where I'm mocking girls about this, you know. Hey, so the reason you wore blue today was because, you know, it's a cancer day or something like that. Mm-hmm. And then just like write off everything she does, like as if she has no free will, you know, just like, the reason you're doing it is because of some fortune telling thing and, you know, just keep mocking her about it. It's a fun thing to do. But if she's actually taking this stuff seriously, where she's like not doing something because of some star sign or some something about her, you know, some bullshit she believes in, yeah, that's bullshit. Then you should avoid that stuff. Yeah. And a lot of guys will like, they'll be in dates and they find out their girls, the their partner or the date partner is into it and they automatically start making fun of the girls like oh l- let me guess like you know and they're just making fun of her but you got to realize people who take this stuff seriously they spent months to years just consuming content on it some go to seminars on it they fill their mind with it so when you're attacking that they actually feel like you're attacking them so for from the guy's perspective it's just like a quick little joke but from the girl's perspective they feel like they're being attacked Hey, I've always attacked them for it, and so far it's worked out well for me. So, but no complaints like, so far. It seems Mark like you do it. You do it in a joking way, though, right? Or do you like actually make fun of them? I mean, I wouldn't do it in a hurtful way because I'm trying to sleep with them, right? I I have my priorities straight. I'm yes. not trying to win some kind of argument. I mean, I'm a simple guy. I'm out in a date. <laughs> 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 so yeah, typically I'm just trying to have fun. Yes. So it could be something as simple as you know. I mean, just think of any random joke. Let's say that she's something like she's a Sagittarius, and you say something like, "Oh, so that's why you like that." That makes a lot of sense. I see. Have you gone on a lot of dates with girls that believe in this stuff? I'm telling you, every single girl, every single girl believes in this stuff. All of them. Okay. The few that I've dated, bro, I've been kind of, I guess I've been lucky, but they're just like, "Oh yeah, that's bullshit." I can't believe like so many girls are into it. Um. Okay, okay, maybe like you're you're right, but most of the dates I've been on, like they haven't been too much into it. Besides this one girl, I'm telling you, bro, like it's right after a traumatic moment, like a divorce. Like that's when they How start. Or really like a girl to dating, because typically if you date like a younger girl, like 18, 19, 20, 21, they're almost always into it. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm not like if I'm like 30, I'm not dating an 18 year old girl. Like to me, that like I get it. Like there's a lot of guys that are like, yo, that's like my thing. But I, like for me, like it's just like way too young. Like I need at least like 24 up. Oh, I don't date girls that are older. Typically, I, I avoid that stuff. I I want to date younger girls it's for the simple reason that I mean, now that I'm married, like before mm-hmm. I was married. Before I married, I was dating younger girls because, you know, they are marriage material, right? Let's say you date a girl for two years. She's 19. You met her when she was 19. Then she's 21. You get married to her at 21. But right. if you date a girl when she's 25, you date her for two years. But then what? Are you going to marry a 27-year-old? No. So I mean, it doesn't work out, right? That's why I've always dated younger girls. Prefer to date younger girls. Okay. I've done it before where I was like 28. The girl was like, the girl was like, I don't know, like 21, which isn't that young. And she was like attractive, but there was just like nothing to talk about besides like, I don't know, like she was like into like TikToks and like um like social media trends and stuff. I'm like, okay, this is kind of like killing my vibe right now. So I, I get it though. Like from the biology argument, like 18 is like the prime years. But like from my perspective, like if I'm 32 and I'm dating an 18 year old girl, this is a girl that's like fresh out of high school. And like she's just entering college. She's a freshman in college. It's just like, I don't know. Um, it's never been my thing, at least. I've when always enjoyed dating, it. You know, it's like one of those yeah. lighthearted things you can do with girls that I mean, you can just have fun and not do anything intellectual. I've actually gotten like the opposite experience, bro. Cause these girls, I've noticed they're like really opinionated. But that opinionated stuff is not grounded in reality. 
where some of them like yes you're right like they're like very pure all of that stuff but a lot of them they're like super social justice warrior they like are like anti-capitalist they're like all of this stuff and it's like you know like when someone's like um like wisdom is quiet ignorance is loud they're very loud and i'm just like mm, like this girl's like already irking me a lot so that's been like a couple of my experiences but you're I've saying had that like, experience like, before here's yeah. my take on it though a lot of times right a lot of these girls they don't actually believe everything they're saying they're just they just say it because everyone around them says this type of stuff and they want to be accepted by everybody but if you make it sound okay to not say that type of stuff she will typically follow in the sense that like i'm not a feminist of course but i am extremely sexist in everything i say and i've had a lot of girls be like hey you're very sexist and mm-hmm. i will say something like i'm the fucking king of sexism and there's no one more sexist than me i mean i, right. I deserve to be like the king of sexism the spokesperson of all women mm-hmm. and you know they're going to assume it's a joke at first but you do it two three times and then either they just you know disqualify themselves they just leave like oh, fuck it i'm out i'm not going to date you or they just accept it okay fine you know he's like this you know her she is like that it's one of those flaws in him and then it's okay i mean it's not a big deal you can disagree typically girls will change their minds i mean i have turned quite a few girls from feminists to not being feminists some of right. them actually learned to cook to date me so i think that that is you know, possible just because yeah. they open as feminists doesn't mean they truly are feminists yeah my thing is like you know if i'm trying to hook up like what your what your life philosophy is doesn't matter to me but if i'm trying to invest in a relationship i'm not trying to like teach too much in the beginning stages over time once i've like made it official with you i'll teach you more about how it's like to be like a adult um and that's why i think the guy being a couple of years older than the girl is always ideal i don't really know if guys should get with girls older than them um so i think when the guys older they could always like bring the girl to a more adult like state but what i don't want to do is like change like core radical philosophies and basically make you unradical like that's not something that i'm trying to do especially cuz i have other stuff to do in my life and in addition to that you could make them unradical but chances are they have other 18 year old friends who have been like in the college system the college system is now making folks radical day and day and night so you're basically doing your job and then you put them back into society they're interacting with their friends who are 18 to 21 and it's just like undoing a lot of your hard work and it's just something that i'm like ah forget it i'm not really trying to get into this right now where i noticed like that shift in thinking from 23 to 24 where girls like really trying to get married at least here like girls in, that are 18 are not trying to get married so you got to really ask yourself as a guy what do i want do i want to hook up then it's whatever but if i'm trying to get married i got to actually find someone who's like open minded towards that where what i think it makes sense but yeah, i'm telling you it's much better to date younger girls disagree yeah I, i would disagree with that I, i mean 18 like you think like a i i see this as a red pill talking point but i i, I like i don't know if like a 35 year old dating an 18 year old girl at least in the west is the smartest decision cuz i don't think an 18 year old girl that's in society where your girl she was like you said she was kind of insulated due to her culture right yeah but then i wasn't 35 right i was like no no 27. you weren't 35 yeah you were 27 but like um but your girl overall like she was in like this village growing up right exactly see then i can see it because she was also open to getting married right okay so she was open to getting married where like if the girl is like young and she's not open to getting married i think that's a very big risk to try to turn them into marriage material i i see what you mean i i agree with a large bunch of what you said because i didn't realize that you were talking about 35 year olds but i mean of course if you're 35 you're not going to get a lot of 21 year olds 20 year olds want to date you it's just it's just how life is you know you're going to find some women who are like 25ish at best not a 20 year old 
if you're but an if established you are... 35 year old guy dude you actually can get like a 21 year old if you want it because now you have like the cars you have like a apartment like lifestyle where other 21 year old guys like they're living in college dorms so the 21 year old girl is comparing other college dorm guys to this established 35 year old so if you're an established 35 year old and you wanted to get 21 year old girls technically you can at least here oh there maybe but here it's very very difficult because there's a big social stigma attached to dating someone 15 years older than you i mean girls wouldn't want to do that it's like, it really really people look down upon them for this because people know why they're dating this guy right oh like the, the gold digger status not the gold digger status like people know they're dating this the, this guy is trying to fuck this girl and this girl's only dating him for money and that kind of reduces that girl's perceived value i mean it takes away that that excuse that i'm dating for love or something so it's very raw and clear what's happening so girls don't do that here i mean it, there's obviously exceptions but it's not very very common here here like let's say you're a 35 year old and you want to get married you will probably have to look for girls who are 26 and above okay there i can i can see it happen yeah i will say that I, I can say one thing though. If you're trying to get married, right, you have to understand marriage is about children. And you know, if you marry, if, let's say you meet a girl when she's 27, I'm assuming that you want to date her for two years before you make the decision and pull the plug and get married. By the time you get married to her, you're going to be 29. She's going to be 29. And I'm assuming you want to stay married for a year before you have kids. So, what? You're going to have kids after she's 30. That I means it's possible, happens all the time. But it's also not the ideal thing to do. Ideally, you want to meet the girl when she's 21, marry her when she's 23, have the kid when she's 24. Mm, right, right. Um, okay. I could, uh, Yeah, I could see that. Uh, ideally speaking. Um, but it also factors in, like, how many kids do you want? The thing is that you can always choose to have fewer kids. Mm -hmm. You can't increase it right what's like the latest a girl can get pregnant uh, just out of curiosity or where on it's average not or do you mean like risk. exceptional situations yeah like what's like the latest you can as a girl have kids without being like considered high risk pregnancy 35 i think like maybe 33 ish okay 35 and above are called geatric pregnancies where it's literally like senior citizen pregnancies so and the risk for having autistic kids and everything is significantly higher. Yeah, then like 21, but then you could also do it at like like 24 to 25-ish, where nowadays a lot of people are getting engaged within a year. If they found their partner and they're both marriage-minded, you spend like one to two years like being a couple, traveling, whatever. And then by 26, 27, like you work on having the first kid. That's not considered a high risk, is it? And if you want to have three kids... Maybe it's about, possible. Yeah. All I'm saying is that if you date a girl at 24, right, the chances mm -hmm. of her being a virgin are like close to zero. Not close to zero. I mean, it's very, very low. Okay, at least okay. in the West. So yeah. I mean, if you if you want to get married, right, you have some kind of standards. Okay, she shouldn't have been fucked by three different guys before. Like, you don't want that all that all that bullshit, right? Probably you want a virgin girl who is like cultured, traditional. And she's young, so she can have lots of kids and she learn from you, things like that, right? Yes. And you have, like, much better luck looking for that when she's 18, 19, 20 than if she's, like, 25. Because if she's 25, probably she's going to be going to have been fucked by at least a few guys before. I don't, I'm don't. i not okay with that. I think most guys are not. Right. No, no, that's, um, yeah, that's, like, a different variable, um, which, like, a lot of guys do prioritize for sure. Um. Okay, so how old do you think the guy should be if, like, he's like considering an eighteen-year-old person, twenty-seven? Yeah, I wouldn't recommend an age gap more than say twenty years. So, twenty-seven, twenty-eight, thirty, maybe. Yeah, I I would, I'll say one thing though. It's it it really depends on your culture because in India, yeah, like earlier, a ten-year gap would not be considered big. Like my dad is almost ten years older than my mom. But my nowadays, dad is like years older than my mom. Nowadays, though, even five years is considered too much. You know, nowadays people want like three years, two years younger. But 
you know a lot of countries like 15 20 years is not considered a big gap like in thailand 15 years is not a big deal well yeah that's why you got to like focus on like what the location is as well where here like um 15 years is considered a lot but in bangladesh for example it's not considered that much i mean my parents are 12 years apart i know um like my uncles and aunties some are like 14 15 years apart no one bats an eye here though if you're doing that that's considered like kind of creepy um this is actually a very 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 like um polarized topic as of late cuz it it like got sparked up again when um let me see have you ever heard of dane cook no one second let me just see something real quick um so dane cook is 50 and he got engaged to this girl that's 23 but chances are like you know they were talking beforehand and apparently like um they met at a party when she was like 17 or 18 so dane cook was like 40 something when they were initially talking so it started like some conversation like is what dane cook did creepy and like there was some discussion from that and after that i've noticed like if you go on social media that's a very polarized topic where like if someone's if it's like a 40 year old guy dating um 19 year old girl is that creepy yes or no some are making the argument like no like after 18 they're legal whatever they want to do they want to do others are making the argument um it's a little creepy because of the difference in life experiences so it's like See, a polarized it's one debate. of those things where you know there's no like a there's no right answer but if these two guys are in the legal age to get married and they want to get married I mean why would you stop them you know it's one of those things where like i personally think that two guys having sex is creepy as fuck you know it's it's, it's totally weird that <laughs> being gay exists i mean it's fucking insane like what the fuck are you doing like putting your dick in some guy's ass like, what the fuck is that <laughs> like i mean personally i think it's extremely creepy but these guys probably will not think it's creepy the, you know these western westoids they're like hey this is perfectly normal like guys having sex is normal So it's like if you are okay with guys having sex with each other like some guy taking a dick in his ass why do you have a problem with a 19 year old girl having sex with a 40 year old man like it, I mean it's much more natural than what you guys are okay <laughs> with so. This is one of those things where like societal thinking versus individual thinking is different. Society wise, I'm like what they do is what they do. If it's after the legal age, then go ahead do what you do. But if my daughter, 19-year-old ever bought home a 43-year-old dude, I'm going to be grilling that dude. I'm gonna be like, oh, "What the hell? Like what are you doing?" Um so societally speaking, I'm like, "Do you, homie?" But as a parent, I'm going to be like, "What the fuck?" At least here, where over there like I know like like i said like age gaps definitely exist um a lot of like brown people if you see like if you ask them like what's the age gap between your parents most are going to at least say 8 to like 12 years that's like seen as a norm so i guess the cultures do a play some sort of role in this as well it plays a huge role actually because what would you do you if like your this, girl like if everyone you, yeah. around you is mm-hmm. marrying girls their own age If that's happening then you'll probably start dating your girlfriend from like some kind of college or something you know but yeah. if everyone around you marries a girl who's 10 years younger well then you won't date anyone around you like i mean <laughs> the girl i'm supposed to marry is like 12 years old <laughs> yes 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 i just can't picture like being like a 30 year old guy like my, like my girl's like hey i'm going to prom like do you want to come with me i'm like the fuck the hell no um What would you do if your daughter brings home like a 40-year-old guy and she's 19? Yeah, that's not going to turn out well. Like that's not <laughs> something I'm okay with. It's one of those okay. things, right? I think it should be allowed if someone wants to do it, but I don't think it's like the best decision to make. Yeah, it's different when it's happening to you. Um No, it's not that it's different when it's happening to me in the sense I'm not happy for not the just, girl yeah. dating who's 40 years, the guy who's 40. I'm not happy for her. Yeah. I don't think it should be illegal or she should be stopped from doing it. I don't think this couple should be broken up. Right. But right. It's I'm not, not happy purpose. about this. Like, I don't think it's like a good situation to be in. Right. It's like so I don't think not... prostitution should be illegal, but I don't want my daughter to be a prostitute. 
Right, right, right. It's like acceptable on a societal level, but that's not something that we want on a personal level. Exactly. Like I don't want to do it, but if someone else wants to do it, let them. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, interesting. I wonder if there's any other like topics like that where it's like really polarized. Man, Probably. nowadays everything is polarized. I'm telling you, yeah. it's like. There's another one. Um, you're probably not going to be able to relate to this because you live in the uh, like east, but in the west, a lot of couples break up because the guy wants to keep a gun in the house, and the girl is like terrified by that. Interesting, man. I'm not even joking. Western people have so many guns. I was seeing my friend's gun collection, and the guy has like military grade rifles and shit. I'm like, who the fuck are you going to do with this? Stuff? <laughs> It is a debate, though, bro, because like girls, like they're fearful that like, you know, what if the man becomes unhinged and like he just shoots up the family? That's one concern. Second concern is what if the kids find the gun? Because a lot of folks have like uh, unfortunately lost their kids due to like discovering the parent's gun. But the guy is thinking like, hey, look, I'm the protector of the family. Let's say someone is trying to break in. Us just calling the cops. If we call the cops, the cops aren't going to be like, all right, we're on our way. You're going to have to talk to one of these dispatch units. Sometimes these dispatch units are having a bad day. They're like asking you too many questions while someone is trying to break into your house. So now it's like, I got to protect my family. I don't want a baseball bat. I want a gun so I could fight fire with fire. So the guy is like trying to explain from the lens of I'm the protector. You're not going to understand what it's like to be a protector. So he's arguing from that lens. The girl's arguing from her lens. And a lot of them cannot see eye to eye on this. So they break up. Some girls will like warn other girls, like, "Hey, you better ask the uh, the guy the question from the beginning. Is he okay with keeping a gun in the house?" Because a lot of these men nowadays say yes. So girls are like warning other girls about it, and a lot of guys are adamant in this. Like they have their mind made up; they're not going to switch their mind at all. That's a very interesting topic. I can give you an example because back in my hometown, right, there was a fourteen-year-old kid. Who accidentally killed his mom with a gun. I mean, it's a kid, right? He didn't know how to use it. Mm -hmm. He was like having fun with it and ends up shooting his mom and the mom dies. I can see the dangers of having a weapon in your house. I mean, it can go off. Let's say a kid finds it, he's playing with it, he doesn't know where the fuck it is. Mm -hmm. And he accidentally kills himself or someone else. But I can also see the other perspective where it's like a useful self-defense weapon, especially in a country where criminals tend to have guns. So exactly. I can see both perspectives. I don't know which one's right. I think something like a gun that's not like easily accessible, like something that's well hidden. There's lockers can... for that. Yeah, there's lockers for that. Um so that's the thing where like if it's just a guy that's just like i want to get a gun today and he's just like a dumbass about it i don't think that's smart but i think if the guy like took the course like there's a course that you can take you have to actually get like approved for it license he has well knowledge in it then he's taught how to use the kits to keep it locked up and away from others i think then it's smart but if it's just one of these dumb guys that like watched an action movie and is like i want a gun then this is like someone not to consider. But girls, when they're like initially scoping out the guys, she doesn't know what kind of guy it is. She doesn't know if it's like a dummy guy that watched an action movie and wants a gun or it's a guy that put a lot of thought behind it. So it's, it's, it's one of the more polarizing topics right now. And people do not see eye to eye at all because eventually one person is going to get their way and the other person has to learn to live with it. I can say that I can see both perspectives. I, I I don't know which one's right. Like I haven't I haven't like given it a lot of deep thought. Mm -hmm. But I think a reasonable compromise could be having a gun that's not easily accessible, so it can't actually harm you in any way. Mm -hmm. Would be like a middle ground. Although yes. I will say that guns are very expensive. Like I was talking to my friend who has this big gun collection. And he's like, this gun is $2,000. This gun is $3,000. I'm like, what the fuck are you spending this kind of money on guns? For? Like, yes. what, is he, what are you doing? Like, he, He's an American, right? So in his country, he can just go to a shop and buy a gun. Well, it's not and that easy. You got, you got to get like um, approval and stuff for it nowadays. He lives in, in many, Texas. Uh, okay, yeah. Texas, that's like a, a different uh, area, but yeah, like some states, because here it really depends on the states and what their rules are with guns. So in addition to what you were saying, like the whole, um, like 
you guys have a gun, but you guys keep it hidden. Like you would think that would end the debate. But now another concern a lot of girls have is like, what if my husband becomes like a tyrant? And like, yeah, you fuck know, he, that. if you think that, don't matter. Yeah. Yeah. So the, 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 there's like two like big irks that you got to like deal with. If like, let's say everything is going perfect. You guys are on the verge of moving in. And then this topic comes up. You guys never discussed it. It's going to be, it's going to be a tricky situation, man. It's one of those things where, right, where you don't expect it, but some, some things just break couples up. Like, I, I know a few couples who've broken up or something like, you know, the girl is Sikh and the guy is Hindu. And they're like, so which religion is the kid going to practice? Like, we're going to raise the kid to be Hindu or Sikh and they break up over it. Mm -hmm. So one of those things where you got to figure it out early before you spend three years dating someone. It's a waste of time. Another one is the halal meat, where you guys don't have to really focus on that. But like for Muslim couples, one guy just eats anything that's not pork. And the other person eats like strictly halal meat. And the person who eats halal meat only wants halal meat in the house. While the person who is like, I don't really care if it's halal or not. I just don't want it to be pork. That's another point of contention. What so. type are you? Do you care about it being halal? I don't really care as long as it's not pork then like i'm good but my girl cares a lot so this is one of those things i'm just like okay i'm gonna like because she's like compromised a couple of things for me so it's one of those things where like i kind of like have to see her side more because people who only eat halal they don't want like non-halal meat in the house because of like you know you guys are sharing like pantries and like the fridge all of that stuff so it's like a big point in contention so i don't really care but like my partner cares a lot so it's one of those things where like i'm starting to like weigh the you know the pros and cons um you know in india it's actually very very difficult to not eat halal it's it's difficult not to eat halal right because every restaurant is halal everything because india has 20 percent muslim populations right mm -hmm. so no one wants to lose out on the market share so any place that sells meat is going to make sure the meat is halal so literally like ninety percent of the meat in India is halal, right? And even here, like Indian restaurants, like stuff, all halal meat. Like you don't even have to ask. But the thing is, like you know, what if like it's like McDonald's or like let's say we go to that's a what party. I'm you. Even McDonald's here is halal. Yeah, like there, like for sure. Like I see that. But in the U.S., like my thing is like to make a commitment. It's not like she's asking me to like be halal like forever in life. It's just like in the household, like in a shared space. I'm just like, man, like I could do that, but I don't know if that's a commitment I could make fully yet. So I just said, let me think about it. Um, but nowadays, different places are opening up where you could get halal meat, but it's not like India where like everything's halal. Here, like you could find it, but you got to seek it out rather than everything's halal. Or even like... I wouldn't even say 20% is halal. Like, I would say, like, 15%. So you got to seek it out. Yeah, if you care about the stuff, like, if the girl cares about it, I would say just let her have it, but then put the responsibility of it on her. Like, you got to buy all the groceries. I'm not going to sit and waste my time looking for halal. But if you care about it so much, then this is your, your department now. Yes, yes, yes. Did, did, was there anything, like, you had to, like, compromise on? Or has she, has she have you been mainly getting your way so far? Man, I always get my way. Oh, okay. So you haven't like really had to compromise on anything? I'm very good at getting women to do what I want. So I haven't had to do that much. For example, I eat meat, but my wife doesn't. Okay. Well, give us some time, man. Eventually something presents itself where you're just like, oh, shit. Like, she's like really adamant on this. Yeah, probably at some point it's going to happen. But nothing so far. Nothing so far. Okay. I mean, I'm not very hard line on a lot of topics i mean for for a lot of things where i mean if she really cares about something i'm like okay fine do it i don't give a shit like I mean, but you gotta do it and i'm not gonna waste my time on it okay okay so yeah no you've been lucky then so far i have two questions for you or mm -hmm. one for you and one for both of us uh so this is from they became us did harsh hire a consultant or some agency to move his business to a tax-free zone Yes, but I will not tell you which one. Okay, okay. Um, and then the next one is from Arka Jamali. 
I have a question for both of y'all. I just started freelance, uh, freelancing website building and wanted to ask what the fair price was to build a website internationally in dollars. Along with writing a blog, I'm confused on how much I should charge. Thanks. It depends on what the website is, right? I mean, there's no hard and fast answer. But if you're building someone a whole blog with lots of pages and everything, then it's going to be like $2,500 to $5,000. If you do a lot of graphics and everything for the blog, it's going to be about 5000 bucks. If it's like a landing page for a product, it's going to be like four, 500 bucks. It really depends on how much work that product was and how much work you need to put in. For example, if it's like a waiting list, like a single page waiting list with just some text and an image here and there, it could be as little as $200. If it's a little more complicated, like three, four pages, but it's still like not a full website, like an about me section and a waiting list and some stuff like that, that would be about 500 bucks, maybe 600. If it's like a full blog, but you didn't have to do any of the graphics, you just had to design the pages, then maybe like 3000 bucks, 2500, 4000 at most. But if you had to do all the graphics, the logos and everything, that probably be like 7000 bucks. It, it really depends. I mean, there's no real answer here. I mean, the question is not specific enough. Yeah, and to even charge that much, you need like a body of work too, because that's when people like some guys are willing to pay like five thousand plus. I paid that much for my website, but the guy had a body of work, and yeah, what Harsh was mentioning, like how dynamic is it? Like, is it something that requires constant maintenance? Because if it does, then you should also offer another service where you do like web maintenance service. Because my site, like every now and then, it needs new plugins updated, and I don't want to do that. So I get the guys that built my website and I pay them 30 somewhat dollars a month just to like maintain the site. So if it ever crashes or something like that, he'll take care of it. So you want to ask yourself um, if you can even offer that service as well. But first I would recommend like get your body of work. Um, I'm not, the website grind is really not my thing. I think Harsh has more experience with that. So I don't actually know the price. I just know it from a consumer's lens. Like I needed to build a website and get it maintained. See, more often than not, it really depends on how much work that website is and what type of client are you dealing with. For example, if you're dealing with someone who is just starting a website and you can't charge a lot, but then you shouldn't even accept that work because, you know, someone who's just starting out can't pay you much. I'm telling you, people who are just starting out are so cheap because they have no idea how this thing works, right? They'll try to offer you things like $20 for a logo. Like, I'm going to, I want a logo. It should be very good, but I'm going to pay you like 50 bucks. Yeah. No one's going to, no good designer is going to agree to that, you know. So you got to take work from people who are established in the business, who have paying capacity, and then provide them the best service possible and charge accordingly. If you work with peasants, you're going to get paid peanuts. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think that was it, Harsh. Um, any other... Any other questions and stuff? No, so far. I mean, good question, though. I mean, I'm happy to answer any questions. And I think Arman is pretty happy to answer them as well. So leave them in the comments below. And we'll see you guys two weeks hence. Have a good day and see ya.